when the mind's narrative seem oppressive. It's good to think about the Buddha on the night of his awakening. You think you have narratives. First knowledge he gained was many, many, many narratives, many, many lifetimes. And you could have dwelled on the details, but seeing the huge number, you began to reduce things to their common terms. With each lifetime he had an appearance, and he had some food, and he had this or that experience of pleasure or pain, and then he died. That's it. Eating, pleasure, pain, die. Then you come back again for more eating, pleasure, pain, die. But his appearances and his pleasures and pains varied from life to life, quite radically. From the very high levels of heaven down to the lower levels of hell. And so how did he solve that problem? One, the problem of figuring out why there was such a variety. And two, how to get out of it. He thought of all beings the whole cosmos. These are beings passing away and then being reborn in line with the karma. And although he saw the workings of karma as very complex, there was a basic principle. You act on skillful intentions, there's going to be a good destination. You act on unskillful intentions, there's going to be a bad destination. Now, these can mix in various ways. So sometimes they cancel each other out, sometimes one takes charge over another. But still there's a pattern, and he saw the pattern by enlarging his mind. It was because he enlarged his mind, then he was able to focus in on what was going on in the present moment without dragging all the narratives in. And so as you're sitting here with the meditation, focusing on the breath, if these narratives do come up about how you're not making progress as fast as you'd like, about how the goal seems far away, get out of yourself. Think of all the beings in the world, and you're heading in the right direction. You have compassion for them, and have some compassion for yourself. There's a story in the canon of a monk who's sitting in the forest, and his meditation is not going well. It's nighttime, and off in the distance he hears a festival in a nearby village. Music, singing, dancing. He comes down on himself. He says, at least these people know how to find some pleasure in life. Here I am, miserable, living alone in this little hut making myself suffer. A deva appears to him and says, Do you realize how lucky you are? There are beings going to hell right now. They really envy you, because you're on the way out. So again, you have to get out of your echo chamber inside by thinking of other beings. There's a passage we repeat again and again about being subject to aging, illness, and death, separation. And we have karma. We're the owners of our karma. And whatever we do, for good or for evil, to that we will fall heir. That reflection, the Buddha says, should make you more heedful. But then he expands the reflection. All beings everywhere are subject to aging, illness, and death. They're the owners of their actions. That, he says, gives rise to a different emotion. It's enough to get you on the path. In other words, some 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 way go. You realize how big the issue is. And now, no matter where you might go in the, in the universe, whatever way you might be reborn, it's all the same sort of thing again and again. So you want to get out. This is why, in the description of right mindfulness, the Buddha talks about being aware of the body in and of itself, etc., feelings, mind states. 
mental qualities, both inside and out. Now, if you think of mindfulness as meaning awareness, you wonder how you're going to be aware of somebody else's breath, or how aware of their greed, aversion, or delusion, or their feelings of pleasure and pain. But that's not what mindfulness means. It means keeping something in mind. And here the reflection is, whatever you're experiencing now, there are other beings experiencing the same sort of thing. So on the one hand, you're not in a miserable situation vis-a-vis -vis other beings. But if you sit here thinking about where you would like to be or who you would like to be, you're going to run into the same sort of thing again and again. Here you're on, on a path that leads to a goal where there is no where. There is no location, and there's no identity that you take on. In other words, it's totally unlimited, even free of the limitations of things that basic. So take joy in the path. And as for the voices that come in about this, that, or the other person, or this, that, or the other event, try to get them in a larger perspective. You've been through worse. You've been through better. But if the better were really all that good, then it wouldn't lead to worse again. You're on the path out. And it's a good path to be on. So console yourself, urge, rouse, and encourage yourself in the same way that the Buddha would urge, rouse, and encourage his listeners. Because the goal really is good. Sometimes it sounds something like an absence of things, and it is absent, but it's absent of a lot of undesirable things. But there's a lot positive about it as well. And whether you get there fast or slow, in this lifetime or some future lifetime, the important thing is that you stay on the path. This is one of the reasons why we develop mindfulness, is so we don't change our minds. We do have this problem. The mind is so quick to change direction. You can't say that it's innately good or innately bad, but it is innately changeable. But even that innateness is something that can be trained and tamed, brought under control. So you develop mindfulness, alertness. So you can catch yourself in time. As you go from moment to moment, mindfulness is there to remind you again and again to be alert, to focus on what's skillful and what's not skillful, and try to understand these things so you can really develop what's skillful, abandon what's unskillful. It's good work. and you're learning the skills that are needed. So again, think of the Buddha. As he said, when he got on the right path, it was when he was able to look at his thoughts, not so much in terms of what he liked thinking about or what he was stewing about or whatever, but he pulled out of his thoughts and looked at them as causal processes. Where does this thought come from? Where does it lead? If it leads in a bad direction, why think it? You have so many other choices of things you could think about. Why do you focus on things that pull you down? Focus on things that are uplifting. It's the point that a John Swat liked to make a lot, that we do have the power to choose where we're focused. What we take as our object or in the Polyidium, what we take as our support. If you're going to take as your support somebody that's really rickety and miserable, why? It's an old habit. But habits can be changed. You know, a lot of us are in our particular worlds and are with our particular identities. And there's a certain resistance. 
this is who I am, this is the world in which I live. I don't want to change it. It's like that woman who came here one time. I was talking about how she had had an experience of oneness. And then she turned to me and said, I don't want you to take that away from me. I said, I have no, I, no desire to take it away from you, but I just want you to know there's something better. And it's only when you see the drawbacks of what you think is really good, that's when you're open to what's something better. But then, then again, there are many times when even when you see the drawbacks, you just can't let go. Like that poor man in the sutta who has a little house, it's not the best sort of house, an ugly wife, an ugly bed to sleep on, an uncomfortable bed to sleep on, an ugly little pot with just a few pumpkin seeds, but he can't let it go. And part of it is an unwillingness to leave what you already have for fear that you have nothing. And the other is a lack of imagination. So imagination can be used on the path, and its important use is thinking about not just yourself, but all beings. So you can get out of yourself and see that there are alternatives, there are other possibilities, other ways of thinking. And there are many other ways of thinking that are really good. So they're available to you. They're possible. So why choose something that's not? So get out of yourself a bit. Ventilate your mind. And you'll be able to come to the present moment with a lot better attitude. And you'll see things you didn't see before. Things that really can be liberating. So look for them. They're there.